Sure, you remember Minnie Pearl from the legendary variety show Hee Haw, but did you ever eat at a Minnie Pearl's Chicken? Minnie Pearl's Chicken has a very interesting story, one that is now dubbed the Minnie Pearl Chicken Debacle. If you're curious as to what happened, stick around. This is going to be good. Hi, this is T-Roy, and you're watching Restaurant Rewind, What Happened to Minnie Pearl's Chicken. Today in this episode, we are taking a closer look at Minnie Pearl's, a short-lived franchise concept that took the fast food industry by storm. It realized tremendous growth and potential, only to literally implode within a few short years. So if Minnie Pearl's was doing so well, what happened? Well, let's take a look at the evolution. To really understand how Minnie Pearl's chicken started, we need to first take a look at another fried chicken favorite, Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know the story. Colonel Harlan Sanders began selling fried chicken out of the back of his gas station in Kentucky. Later, he decides to franchise his secret chicken recipe, and by 1963, his chicken was being sold at over 500 locations. The colonel sells it for $2 million, and in 1966, when the chain went public, early investors became very wealthy. Now enter Nashville attorney John J. Hooker, who had just narrowly lost the Democratic nomination for Tennessee governor. Hooker and his younger brother and law partner, Henry, watched as Kentucky Fried Chicken opened location after location, and intrigued at what they saw happening, thought they could wrangle some of that same success by opening their own chicken franchise. They felt that this new chicken business would ride on the coattails of Kentucky Fried Chicken, just like Pepsi did with Coke, and they felt that there were still untapped markets that Kentucky Fried Chicken had not reached yet. Copying Kentucky Fried Chicken seemed simple. Number one, get a good chicken recipe. Number two, get a well-known celebrity to endorse it. Number three, franchise the concept. And number four, make lots of money. The Hooker brothers had heaps of ambition and strategy. The only problem is they didn't have a lick of experience in the restaurant business up to that point. Harlan Sanders had decades of experience to perfect his craft, and he still needed someone to take it to the next level. But how hard could it be, right? Undaunted, the brothers raced forward. Let's review the strategy. Get a good chicken recipe. Since they didn't have a chicken recipe for the new venture, the Hooker brothers hired a Chicago food laboratory to develop a recipe that they felt was as good or better than Kentucky Fried Chicken. Get a good chicken recipe. Check. Number two, get a well-known celebrity to endorse it. John J. Hooker figured the public adored Sarah Collie Cannon's Minnie Pearl character on Hee Haw and would certainly embrace the idea of a family chicken recipe. Minnie Pearl signed on and Minnie Pearl's Chicken Systems Incorporated was born. Get a well-known celebrity to endorse it. Check. Number three, franchise the concept. In early 1967, the Hooker brothers sold stock in the new venture to their friends, relatives, and even political figures and supporters for 50 cents up to $1 per share. Hooker's idea caught fire, thanks to his personal magnetism and the free publicity from Nashville newspapers. On Sunday, June 18, 1967, the Tennessean ran a front-page story announcing the establishment of Minnie Pearl's Fried Chicken, where John J. Hooker predicted that the firm, which not yet had sold a single drumstick, would have 500 stores by the end of 1970. Minnie Pearl described her role, It's going to be fun for me and franchisees begged for a chance to own a Minnie Pearls. It was like being a sexy girl at a dance, John Jay said later. Since I wanted to run for governor and then president of the United States, I didn't want to be in business with someone who was a drunk, cheated on his wife, or had a bad reputation in his own community. Always selling, if a franchisee wanted to buy three franchises, John Jay and Henry talked them into buying ten. In August 1967, the franchises started rolling in. A couple months later, a block of 30 franchises. Then three days later, a block of 10. December 1967 brought 30 in Florida and 30 in California. By this time, the company had opened its first restaurant, a standalone building, in front of its headquarters at 2708 Franklin Road. Franchise the concept. Check. Number four, make lots of money. You might remember from previous episodes that the 60s were a great time to be in the restaurant business, and this proved to be true with the up-and-coming Minnie Pearl's Chicken. By February 1968, 
Many Pearls had sold the rights to almost 300 franchise stores, only five of which were in operation. It was then that the company announced its intention to go public. On May 2, 1968, the day of its initial public offering, Many Pearls stock rose from $20 to $40.50 a share. The Hooker brothers had pulled it off, turning an idea into a company worth $64 million, all in less than a year's time. They were on top. Make money? Check. But as you know, there is a lot more to this story. So right about now is when most of you are probably asking, so what went wrong? Well, we know that in pretty quick fashion, Many Pearl's chicken went belly up. And as to what caused it, well, there's a ton of controversy and speculation of shady accounting practices and investors simply being misled. I'll let you be the judge of that. But in my opinion, the demise of Minnie Pearl's chicken was inevitable from the start. Here are my reasons. Number one, the lack of consistency. The fact is, the Hooker brothers had no experience in the restaurant business before diving into the Minnie Pearl venture. They hired a food lab to create the recipe, but the lack of restaurant business acumen kept them from understanding how to maintain consistency. They hadn't opened the first restaurant when they sold the first franchise. They didn't know how to keep consistent product in one store, let alone hundreds or thousands. Number two, goofy accounting. Here is where things get interesting. During Minnie Pearl's first few months of existence, the company would sell a single franchise for $20,000. Franchisees paid 10% or $2,000 up front and agreed to pay the other 90%, $18,000, later. Okay, makes sense. But here's the problem. Many Pearls Chicken Systems Incorporated reported the entire $20,000 as earnings at the time of the agreement. Some say the accounting method was unusual and that Kentucky Fried Chicken did not report franchise fees in this manner. But some say it was normal at the time and totally acceptable. Company officials defended this practice to the end, claiming that the company's accounting firm instructed them to do it this way. Now, I'm no accountant, but it seems to me that front-loading all of those fees would mean that it would be difficult to sustain or even reproduce, even in the short term. And with it being a publicly traded company, I can't imagine stockholders would be too happy if they see the profits plummet shortly after takeoff. Number three, being sales-driven rather than service-driven. The May 1st, 1968 stock prospectus clearly stated that the company's Net income is derived primarily from the sale of franchises. Upon being hired as president of the skyrocketing company, Ed Nelson later recounted that he was immediately concerned about the direction that the business was headed because he knew that they could sell franchises for only so long. Eventually, the focus had to be changed from selling franchises to approving sites, opening stores, and selling chicken. Up to this point, it was mostly a sales business, and not much had been done to perfect the quality or the consistency within the brand. Nelson said later, Being president of the company was like being shackled to the train tracks when you know that there is a train coming right at you. Number four, chasing too many things. Some would say that this franchising model was the undoing of the system, but I think it all comes down to this point. Being distracted by too many things. We all get distracted at times, but I think the evidence is there to support the opinion that they just seem to be constantly distracted by the next best thing. Frankly, it was difficult to keep it all straight, and in the end I felt including all the businesses that they were involved in detracted from the original intent of this video. But here are some highlights that I feel explain my point. Apparently confident that it perfected one concept and was ready to move on to another, only a few weeks after the IPO, Many Pearls announced it was starting a second chain named after gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. And before that news had even sunk in, the company announced it was starting a third chain called Many Pearls Roast Beef. By the end of 1968, Many Pearls had still fewer than 40 restaurants open, almost none of which was making a profit. But in January 1969, Many Pearls Chicken Systems Incorporated changed its name to Performance Systems Incorporated, or PSI, in order to emphasize the idea that it planned to sell more than just chicken. Then the company announced it was branching off into three new concepts, a chain of ice cream stands, an automotive repair chain, 
A daycare chain? What? A daycare chain? Soon after that, the firm made its first acquisition, a 180-unit hamburger chain based in Florida called Royal Castle. Meanwhile, Many Pearls was falling apart, and no one seemed to notice. John J. Hooker's political ambitions also distracted the company from the chicken business. By summer of 1969, corporate employees were spending more time on John J.'s next political campaign than helping PSI's now struggling and desperate franchisees. Banks and investors began to realize that PSI was in real trouble, and the company's stock quickly sank from $40 to about $10. On August 21, 1969, when John J. Hooker resigned his position with PSI and handed the reins to Henry, some assumed he was going to focus on his planned gubernatorial run the following year and were surprised at the announcement of the startup of yet another franchising business, Corporate Concepts. Many Pearls had stopped selling franchises. Newly opened restaurants were losing money fast, with some closing within months of opening. Banks, concerned about Many Pearl's cash flow situation, quit lending money to its franchisees. In the fall of 1969, President Ed Nelson resigned and went back to Commerce Union Bank. Nashville advertising and public relations firm Noble Dury dropped the PSI account. In November 1969, PSI announced an unexpected decline in sales that had caused the company to show a substantial loss for the first six months of 1969 later calculated at $5.5 million. Then the death knell came in 1970. The corporate office was now in over its head trying to help franchisees out of leases, as over half of the 250 stores the company had managed to open had now closed. The Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, began a year-and-a-half-long investigation into PSI for its accounting practices. By late summer, newspapers decided this was no longer just a business story, but a political one, focusing not on businessman John J. Hooker, but on Democratic candidate John J. Hooker, pointing out all of his business failures and exposing companies that the Hooker brothers had mostly kept suppressed. When PSI came out with its annual report in September 1970, the numbers were far worse than anyone had imagined. The company that had been worth $64 million in 1968 had lost almost $31 million in 1969. The annual report also stated that the company's revenues were insufficient to meet its day-to-day -day needs and that it no longer had the ability to borrow money. PSI stock, which once sold at $67 a share, fell to $0.44. Cents. To add insult to injury, in November 1970, Winfield Dunn defeated John J. Hooker, becoming Tennessee's first Republican governor since the 1920s. After a year and a half, the SEC ruled that the company had filed financial statements that were false, which resulted in a rewrite of the company's 1968 annual report to show a $1.2 million loss rather than a $3.2 million gain that year. That conclusion led to a class action lawsuit by PSI's shareholders, and PSI had to liquidate its assets. The last ad I could find for Minnie Pearl's Chicken was September 1973 and seemed to be defunct right after. The liquidation of Royal Castle hamburger chain took until 1975, after which the company became inactive for two years. Then, miraculously, in 1977, the company made a comeback under Nashville attorney named John Chambers, who converted it into a small computer company and changed its name to DSI Corp. John J. Hooker once said, The debacle of Minnie Pearl haunts me to this day. The problem wasn't losing my money, it was losing my reputation for being honest. There is so much more information that I could include in this video, so I've put many links in the description so you can start digging in deeper if you wish. One resource you will find extremely useful is a book published by Providence House Press called Fortunes, Fiddles, and Fried Chicken, a Nashville Business History. It contains a ton of great information. With a subscription, you can also find a ton of information on newspapers.com. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe now to Restaurant Rewind using the link to the right. Then check out the links to the left for similar videos. I'd love to hear your experiences with Mini Pearl's Chicken or Mini Pearl's Roast Beef. Did you like the chicken? Did you like the roast beef? Maybe the franchisee had it together where you lived, or maybe you disagree with my assessment. I'd like to hear what you have to say, 
and what you'd like to see next. So please leave a comment below. I'm T-Roy, God bless, and thanks for watching Restaurant Rewind.